Welcome everyone to the October 27th, 2022 meeting of the Historical Society of St. Catharines. Our president, Dave Willer, couldn't be here tonight. My name is Elizabeth Finney. I'm happy to greet all of you and our special guests, Adam Montgomery and Rochelle Bush. Uh, Gail Benjafield will now introduce the speakers. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say that Rochelle and I, Shelly, have known each other for I don't know how many years, 25, 30, something like that anyway. And she's given me a, a formal introduction. So her formal introduction is Rochelle Bush is a descendant of African-American freedom seekers and was born in St. Catharines. Uh, she is the resident historian of the Salem Chapel, British Methodist Episcopal Church, and Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historic Sites and the owner and operator of Tubman Tours Canada. She's also a current board member with us on the Historical Society, a past board member of the St. Catharines Museum and a certified Niagara Tourism Ambassador. She's a Niagara College graduate and works for Niagara Region, but she's much more than that. She's been on radio, she's been on television, she's been interviewed because the importance of Salem Chapel to the history of St. Catharines and so I will just want to add that as well. And before I introduce Adam, who will be, I think our spec second speaker, I'd like to, to speak about a word that maybe some of you don't know about, taphophile. It's T-A-P-H-O-P-H-I-L-E. And I am one. This is people who like to go, go to cemeteries, whether they're famous cemeteries in Paris and London or, just a homely cemetery in Ontario where you're doing genealogical studies or something of that sort. And because cemeteries are often beautiful places and peaceful places. Adam is a true taphophile. He's a PhD historian whose interests lie in medical history, military history, and cemetery history. And he has two times published book author. He is a two times published book author. Uh, his first book, The Invisible Injured, published by McGill Queen's University Press about trauma in the Canadian military from the First World War through to Afghanistan, uh, was nominated for the Canada Prize by the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences in 2018. It's impressive. He's currently working on a book about cemetery history in Niagara, yes. Reviews of his work and thoughts on his history topics have been in the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, Niagara This Week, many newspapers. And he's also been interviewed on CBC Radio about these interests of his. And so uh, they're going to speak together, uh, or one by one, <laughs> on their current project uh, uh, in Victoria Lawn Cemetery, which is one of the most beautiful cemeteries in Ontario. It's the only one, I believe, with a municipal road running through it. So please uh, welcome my old friend, Rochelle Bush, and my new friend, Adam Montgomery. Thank you, Gail, for the wonderful introduction and the kind words. That was very nice. So just a bit of background about how this project came about. So I'll be discussing that as I show you some of these slides. And of course, the cover slide is about Victoria Lawn Cemetery. And uh, the title is Covered Histories, Victoria Lawn Underground Railroad Gravestones. So the fiscal sponsorship for this project is uh, the Salem Chapel British Methodist Episcopal Church uh, National Historic Site. So Frederick Douglass said in his 1881 biography that the Underground Railroad had many branches. And the one that he was associated with started in Baltimore, Maryland. It went to Wilmington, Delaware. Um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, New York City, Albany, New York, Syracuse, New York, Rochester, New York, where he was the station manager, uh, then crossing at Suspension Bridge, and then at, it ended at St. Catharines. So the one he was associated with or connected with ended at St. Catharines. So we all know the Underground Railroad ended at the U.S. border. When freedom seekers crossed the Niagara River or the Detroit River, once they set foot on British soil, they were automatically free. But Frederick Douglass, in saying that in his 1881 biography, obviously um, legitimized St. Catharines as a terminus on the Underground Railroad. So 
what was the Underground Railroad? So it was a people escaping enslavement. So African Americans escaping enslavement, whether they traveled to the Northern Free States or to Canada, or they went south maybe to Central America or Mexico or places like that. So enslavement, of course, at the lower bottom, forced labor, non-payment where you're oppressed, brutalized by enslavers who were white Southerners. And then one of the dynamics of enslavement was the auction block, the separation of families. Um, freedom seekers were also running away from the procreation or the forced procreation of enslaved black women. And of course, the taskmaster's whip. So it was the oppression and the abuse. And the reason why I say that is when we're conducting tours at the Salem Chapel, or if I'm conducting a tour uh, with Tubman Tours Canada, um, we make certain that everybody knows what freedom seekers were running away from, because that's important to us here in St. Catharines, as well as it's important to us as freedom seeker descendants. So those that did make their way to St. Catharines, many put down roots in this fine city, and they were laid to rest at Victoria Lawn Cemetery. So in the upper left corner, that's a picture of the cemetery, probably circa 1870. Um, the cemetery opened in 1856. So you can see the sign that says St. Catherine Cemetery because that was the original name. Bottom corner is um, about circa 1890. And you can see that the sign there says Victoria Lawn Cemetery. So the name eventually changed. So it went from the city cemetery when it was, uh, opened in 1856 to Victoria Lawn Cemetery and of course named after Queen Victoria. So 27 years ago, there was a number of people in the Niagara region who were instrumental in developing Niagara's Freedom Trail. Victoria Lawn Cemetery is a stop on Niagara's Freedom Trail and that's because of Reverend Anthony Burns. So not gonna go into a lot of his history because um, he's featured and many of you know his story. So Reverend Anthony Burns was an escaped freedom seeker from Virginia. He made his way to Boston. He was captured under the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. Um, that ensued the largest abolitionist revolt in US history. He was returned to enslavement. And then he eventually um, received his freedom. His friends from Boston purchased his freedom. He went on to Oberlin College in Ohio, studied theology. And then by 1860, he made his way to St. Catharines. So we answered the call. Zion Baptist Church was without a minister. Reverend Anthony Burns um, came to St. Catharines. And two years later, he passed on in 1862 at the age of 28. So he's the feature at Victoria Lawn Cemetery. And I'm going to show you his pictures in a minute. So when the Freedom Trail was established, there was a companion book with it called um, The Niagara's Freedom Trail. Of course, it was written by Owen Thomas. And it's a guide to African Canadian history. And over to the right is the map that shows you other identifying sites along the Freedom Trail. So this is Reverend Anthony Burns. And as I just spoke of earlier, um, he was recaptured in Boston in 1854. And it incited the largest abolitionist revolt. And it was called the Boston Slave Riot. And there's his grave site uh, in Victoria Lawn Cemetery. Now, this picture is a few years old. And then you'll see the provincial marker on um, the right-hand side. But again, the important thing about Reverend Anthony Burns, he's laid to rest at Victoria Lawn Cemetery, and that makes Victoria Lawn Cemetery um, one of the sites along the Freedom Trail. So I have several relatives who are buried in Victoria Lawn Cemetery. And when you look at this photograph top, um, you'll just see the a little piece of a gravestone. So at the very top there, that would be my great, great grandmother's, Margaret Harper's. So Victoria Lawn Cemetery, um, here's the map and where you see the green dots, that's where we have uncovered freedom seekers. So the yellow line is where I normally conduct tours. So Anthony Burns is in Old Section G, and then another individual by the name of Henry Ballard is in Section B. And then you have some of Tubman's um, descendants in Old Section G and others who were elsewhere. So now is the time for me to start giving the shout outs to all the wonderful people who have helped me along the way. So when I say old section B, that's where Henry Ballard is buried. And Dennis Gannon, who's past president of the Historical Society, he notified me, he informed me, oh my goodness, maybe, maybe 15 years ago about Henry Ballard being laid to rest at Victoria Lawn Cemetery. And he informed me where his site location was. So I went out there one time on my own 
and I um, uncovered Henry Ballard, but others had done that before me. So I'd like to thank Dennis for that at this time. Then of course, there's Bill Stevens, another past president who identified Harriet Tubman's relatives who are buried in old section G. So there's um, Amanda Stewart Gales Taylor, who's buried in uh, section G. So when I'm in, so, and I do wanna give a shout out to Brian Nari as well, who's um, vice president of the Historical Society, who helped me discover my great grandmother's cemetery stone, who I just mentioned, Margaret Harper. So these are just a few, so I won't go on. There's other people that I could list. If they pop into my mind, I certainly will mention them, but if I forget, you know, please forgive me. So where you see the section, the yellow line, when conducting a tour, we can go out to Victoria Lawn Cemetery. When you're talking about Reverend Anthony Burns, you're out there for maybe 15 minutes. It's been about 10 years since I started taking people out to Victoria Lawn Cemetery and we can stay out there 30 to 45 minutes, just talking about other people who are buried in the cemetery. And one individual I'll mention now would be um, Benjamin Fletcher, who was a member of Harriet Tubman's Fugitive Aid Society. Well, we don't know where Benjamin Fletcher is buried because that area is not identified. But since Adam and I started on this project, we've been able to identify where other people are buried. So other members of the Fugitive Aid Society. And I will get to that. So just back to the green dots, you will see where we have uncovered freedom seekers who are buried in Victoria Lawn. Well, where we've discovered them. So right now we're gonna discuss five featured gravestones. So this is Henry Ballard. I just mentioned him a little while ago. So Henry Ballard is one of the original trustees um, who purchased property from William Hamilton Merritt and Oliver Phelps. So he's on the original deed of uh, the Salem Chapel BME Church. But of course, at the time, it wasn't known as the Salem Chapel. It was Bethel Chapel of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So Henry Ballard is one of five, one of the five original trustees. He escaped from enslavement in Virginia in 1834 with his brother Aaron. So he settled here in St. Catharines and he passed away in 1854. So what's amazing about this is he passed away two years before Victoria Lawn Cemetery even opened. Well, again, at the time, it was the St. Catherine Cemetery. So where he was originally located, that's the $64 million question, not the $64,000 question, but the million dollar question, because we don't know. So he was buried somewhere. He was interned and relocated. His body was relocated and placed in old section B at Victoria Lawn Cemetery. So he arrived in 1834 again with his brother Aaron. So the green arrows on, um, it's not the census record, it's the colored company census or muster record. It was for payment when they fought during the Mackenzie Rebellion. So you'll see Aaron Ballard um, in the center and then his brother Henry Ballard at the bottom. So Henry Ballard was also employed in St. Catharines and he worked for the St. Catharines Journal up until the time of his death. So of course there's more to the story and I'd love to go into full detail with all of them, but maybe some other time. So just giving you a, a snippets of information about these individuals. John W. Lindsay. So his story is told in two narratives, the North Side View of Slavery um, that was published in, published by Benjamin Drew in 1855. So Lindsay, was born in Washington, DC. He was kidnapped, enslaved. Then he escaped from enslavement, made his way to St. Catharines in 1834. He was destitute and broke. By the time he died, approximately 50 years later, he was the richest black man, not only in St. Catharines, but as well um, as Niagara. So he owned a number of properties and he had a lot of businesses. So he was an entrepreneur, but his main business was, he was a blacksmith and a tanner. So that's his stone that's discovered in section A. And you can see how broken it is and Adam will discuss more about that. So from Fuller's directory, you can see that John Lindsay lived at Geneva in uh, Welland Avenue. Um, he was a blacksmith, as I indicated. He was also a trustee of the Salem Chapel BME Church and he owned a brewery. One of his specialties was lemon beer. So a gentleman donated the Lindsay bottle to us, to the Salem Chapel last year. And that's thanks to uh, Dennis Gannon, as well as um, Dr. Dan Broyel. So the individual who was um, taking part in um, a construction site, so it was kind of like a little archeological dig, clearing the site while they were getting ready to construct the school, um, St. Nicholas School over on um, 
Church Street, they discovered um, a bottle. So they were doing something in the area of St. Nicholas School. Uh, the bottle was discovered in the early 80s. The gentleman kept it. And then last year, he donated it to the Salem Chapel. So happy to have that. And you can see the stamp, 1863. Some will argue it says 1868, but makes no difference to us at the Salem Chapel because what's most important is it says John W. Lindsay. Mary Hutchinson. So I mentioned earlier about members of the Fugitive Aid Society that Harriet Tubman was a member of. So Mary Hutchinson is buried in section, old section A as well. So you'll see on the left-hand side, um, the notice about members of the committee. So Harriet Tubman was a founding member. And you can see that Mary Hutchinson is listed as a committee member beside her, as well as John Jones, and then Harriet Tubman's brother, William Henry Stewart. So Mary Hutchinson's husband, William Hutchinson, is also um, a member of the Fugitive Aid Society. So nine members in total, five are buried at Victoria Lawn Cemetery, four can be identified. I mentioned Benjamin Fletcher earlier, we'll never know where he's buried out in old section G. So you can see that there's the city directory again, and it states that William Hutchinson was a laborer and he was living at North and Court Street. So that's from the 1863 directory. I did my DNA two years ago. I don't know how, or I don't know the connection yet, but William and Mary Hutchinson are somehow, I'm somehow related to them. I'll, I'll figure it out one day, but right now it's just a, a task that I'm unraveling slowly because I don't have time to do it every day, but it's a uh, heartfelt and I'm definitely enjoying it. So I'll, I'll eventually discover it. As we were looking for Charles Hall, who was a member of the Fugitive Aid Society, we came across Alfred Triplett, but it wasn't Alfred Hall. So somehow I ended up getting the records mixed up. We ended up finding the area where Charles Bell is located and he's featured on the Historical, Historical Society's um, website page. So while looking in that area, which is section B, just meters away from Henry Ballard, we came across Alfred Triplett. And it's hilarious because Adam and I looked at each other and it's like, who's Alfred Triplett? So, you know, thanks God to for the internet service. Adam quickly Googled it, found out that he is a person of significance um, and he's listed on the St. Catherine's Heritage Advisory um, documents for a person of importance or significance. So one of the things with Alfred Triplett is he was a barkeeper and he worked at the Stevenson house. So he lived on a Lake Street um, near the corner of Duke. And in my mind, I've tried to figure out how the mapping was going at that time. But when you and I don't have notes, I'm just winging it tonight. Um, uh, I still can't figure that out, but uh, I've been in the area several times trying to figure out where dear old Alfred was living, but, um, or just, you know, familiarizing myself with the area because it's near Montebello Park and thinking, wow, this is where he lived back in 1863 um, with all the, in the area of what some would say was an elite area of the town. But the main thing about him was he was revered by members of the white community. He was well-respected by members of the black community and he had a, a prestigious job at the Stevenson House. Amanda Stewart Gales Taylor. So this is her stone and you can see the root that's wrapped around it and Adam will now discuss that further. There's her dad, William Henry Stewart, and it's believed that that picture was taken in St. Catharines. On the right-hand side is her mother, Harriet Ann Parker Stewart. That picture is believed to be taken in St. Catharines as well. And of course, at the bottom is her aunt, Harriet Tubman. And here's Amanda in the 1881 census. She's 12 years old. That makes her, she was born between circa 1868, 1869 in Grantham here in St. Catharines. And she was married twice, yes, um, to Mr. Gales from Canfield, John Gales, and then uh, to Mr. Taylor, and both times she was married in the Salem Chapel. So yeah, that's a, a wonderful history about Amanda because it shows the connection with the family as well as um, not only her connection to her parents, but her connection to the Salem Chapel. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing now, thank you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Adam. Okay, everyone can see the, the slide. 
Yeah. Good? All good. Okay. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, I won't uh, spend too long on it, but I wanted to also thank the HSSC for the invite. Um, very happy to talk about this project. Uh, it's been an exciting one for Rochelle and I, and it's been going on now since the spring of 2021 already. So it's been a, a labor of love and um, something I think we've both gotten a lot of fulfillment from. So thank you for allowing us to talk about it today. So um, just to start, so I, I some of this early part of, the, of what I'm going to say might be sort of common sense to the people that walk to old cemeteries a lot, which I think will be a lot of the members of the HSSC, but I wanted to make this as inclusive as possible to the people who um, who don't necessarily walk old cemeteries all the time. So to start, I wanted to sort of ask you or, or get you to think when, when you hear the word cemetery, what do you think of? And so um, I thought I, I just made a little quick list of some of the things I've heard from people when when I ask them, you know, what do you be, what do you think about cemeteries or they have to tell me what they think about old cemeteries. So some of the things like a place where the dead go to rest. So this is kind of obvious, a place to avoid. So those of us who are taphophiles, as, as Gail point out, like pointed out, like to go to old cemeteries and walk them for various reasons. But to a lot of people, um, a lot of people see them as play. I've heard words creepy, morbid, depressing, sad. And um, this isn't how I think of them. But uh, I think for a lot of people, they're scary places. They make us think about death and things that we don't necessarily always want to think about. Um, but for those of us that like to walk old cemeteries, I think part of the charm is the perspective that they give you when you're having a stressful day or things like that. And you get to walk around and see all these people that came before you kind of puts things in perspective that we all have a journey that we take. Um, so number three is sacred spaces. So this is an obvious one for if you're talking about things like religion um, and, and sort of this, the sacredness of these spaces for people. Um, Another one that's an obvious one, perhaps, but an important one nonetheless, and one of the main reasons that cemeteries still operate is for family to visit deceased relatives. So like Rochelle, I have several family members buried at Victoria Lawn, which is part of the reason that I like to go there. Um, and then I also just like to go to many others as well. So there are also places for a walk, which again, those who go to Victoria Lawn will, will see. If you go there enough, you start to see the same people. You start to recognize the grounds crew. You start to recognize sort of the ebb and flow of the, of a day there. And then the next point is that they're green space. And I think this was something that um, became of increasing importance during early COVID. If, if you paid attention to some of the things that were being said about um, when the parks were being closed, especially in big cities like Toronto, um, a lot of people were looking for places to get out where they could still be socially distanced. And suddenly cemeteries became a place that a lot of people were going because and a lot of people, I think, from that um, dis discovered for the first time that they are a green space to go. And then the last one, which sometimes people don't always think about as well, is that they're a wildlife refuge in urban areas. And um, I always mention in particular Woodland Cemetery in Burlington, um, which is a place where if you go certain times of year, you can see all different kinds of bird species to the point that it's quite popular with with bird watchers. And um, if you go in the fall, you'll see I, I've seen many times people walking around with binoculars looking for a particular type of bird. And if you stand long enough in certain places, um, which my wife Stephanie and I have done, you can actually just hold out seeds or even I think one day I even held out. I had Cheerios, don't ask me why. And and within minutes, um, chickadees will come and land on your hand and start eating out of your hand. So quite quite wonderful place to be. So these are just some of the things that I think um, some of the roles that cemetery play and some of the thoughts that people have about them. And I'm sure you could think of a lot more. But for our purposes today, one of the most important things is that they're a place of community history and stories. So <clears throat> If a cemetery is old, especially in, like in the case of Victoria Lawn from a time when, when most people were buried um, and many had gravestones erected to their memory, much of the community is there. So that allows you to, to see stories and learn about stories and learn about the community itself. So gravestones have a lot of important information about a person and sometimes entire families. If, the, if everyone in the family or most of the people in the family got a gravestone erected to their memory, and then also cemeteries speak to a lot of things and, and everybody from just um, someone having fun with their own family genealogy all the way up to professors, 
Archaeologists have used cemeteries for all kinds of studies, urban growth or decline. Um, decline is, is pretty easy to spot when you drive through some of the old rural communities in southwestern and, and, and southern Ontario and elsewhere in Ontario, where sometimes you'll see just a cemetery left, which tells you there was a community there and suddenly at some point they weren't there anymore. Another important one is histories of disease and then local or national disasters. Um, I've learned about all kinds of disasters that I didn't know about in Canada from reading them on a gravestone, especially in the 19th century when um, for certain disasters, people chose to often, um, they were famous in their day, they were, they were or infamous, whatever word you want to use. And so people actually chose to have those inscribed on the person's gravestone. Um, and one, a few in particular that you'll You'll see around the Niagara Peninsula, it was the Desjardins Canal disaster in, in Hamilton when the train went over the bridge onto the ice. Uh, um, and then you'll see other ones like the, the steamship Victoria um, sinking in London, Ontario. So it's another chance to learn about, about events that you might not necessarily have known of. Uh, gender history is, is another one, which of course you can learn a lot from from, um, for example, why men often got bigger gravestones than their wives, um, and why oftentimes wives were just a single line mentioned at the bottom, rather than um, getting a full, a full thing, a full inscription like their husbands. And then social and religious segregation or lack thereof, depending on the context. So I think you can see where I'm going with this in terms of our project, uh, and why for our project, um, it's important to think about the cemetery as a place of community because the people that we are looking for were a big part of their community. And so we're, we're trying to basically uncover individuals, but also stories of a community. So next, I want to just look at why some gravestones disappear. So obvious one is just time. Stone is, stone is um, most stone materials last a long time, but time gets everything in the end. So that's one big factor as to why they disappear. And then weather, and I'm not going to go into all the different ones, but things like wind, um, the erosion that comes from wind, from particles and, and other dust, debris, et cetera, being blown against the side of a gravestone. You can often tell which way the prevailing winds come from by in a cemetery because the side that gets the more of the prevailing winds well, usually that side of the, the that side of the gravestones in the cemetery will have more wear, more weathering on them than the other side, where where they don't get as much wind on them. And then things like hot and cold cycles, precipitation, air pollution, etc. Ground shift is another one, which you, you can see when you're walking in old cemeteries so quite a bit. You'll see sort of um, where the stone has has either fallen inward or fallen backward or side to side. And then vandalism uh, is one of the worst ones because it's unpredictable. Um, you know, it, it, it comes sometimes sporadically, sometimes in bursts, and you can't really avoid it um, just simply because if people want to cause trouble, um, unless the security, unless the cemetery is big enough to have security guards, um, like patrolling all the time, then people can get in there at some point. So this is one of the unfortunate ones that happens that just you you kind of just keep your fingers crossed. Neglect is another example of what happens to gravestones. And this is just, um, I, I was trying to recall before the presentation which book I read it in, but I, re I recalled in a book that somebody at some point figured out that the average gravestone got visited by two generations at most, and then usually after that, for the most part, they tend to be forgotten about. If I remember the citation, I'll, I'll mention it. But essentially, um, a lot of gravestones get put up and then forgotten about for various reasons. So they, after a while, they disappear. So these are examples of, <clears throat> and I'm sure if you've walked an old cemetery before, you've seen things like this. So these are just two examples of gravestones that are sort of in danger of disappearing one day. Um, so you can see here in this example where there's the, the stone has at some point been either fallen or been laid flat and there's a crack that's formed through the middle and the grass is now growing up through it. And you can see the grass starting to creep around the side. And then here you can see in this example, again, another one where the grass is sort of starting to overtake it. This is another example, these, these flat markers that became somewhat popular in the early 20th century and beyond, especially in lawn cemeteries, um, where, they, where the aim was to 
have as many space like basically to unit make the the grounds look uniform to have all the same style flat and and um, flush with the ground so the unfortunate thing with these is is that if they're not um looked after pretty often then they can very quickly disappear under the grass since they're already sort of flush with the grass to begin with <laughs> so finding gravestones so Again, these are some of the processes. I'm not going to mention all of them, and everybody has different ways of, go, of going about it, but these are some of the most common things that people look for. So cemetery burial records, provincial death registries. One of the things we're very fortunate about in Ontario is that the provincial death registry started in 1869 and are, are easily um, available online. So, um, it, which we're we're very benefit we're very um, fortunate in Ontario because in a lot of places you either have to pay for them, like New York State, for example, and it takes quite a long time even to look up one person, um, or the, or they're just not online. So in Ontario, we're blessed that it, they, the records haven't all made it to the archives of Ontario. So sometimes there are gaps, but for the most part, if you have an ancestry account, you can if you have the phone, you can. Put the app on your phone and literally be standing in a cemetery looking at a gravestone, find the date, and if it's after about the early 1870s when the records start to get a little more reliable, you can look up information about that person right in the cemetery. Another obvious one is newspaper articles, um, just because they, depending on if the person got an obituary or if there was a death notice printed, this can tell you things like um, you know, when the person died, obviously, and sometimes where they were buried, especially in the 19th century, when uh, there were some elaborate funerals, they like to describe the funeral in detail, and then eventually tell you where, where the body was interred. OGS transcripts are a very handy, a very handy tool. Um, I can only imagine the work that goes into them. Um, and they've been done across many decades now. And they're very handy, particularly if you're looking for um, old stones because of the fact that sometimes depending on the date between when the transcription was done and when you're looking for the stone it's disappeared so if you have a if you have an OGS transcript for example that is from the 80s that says this stone was in this row at this time and then now you're looking at it in 2022 you can often use the mentions of the gravestones that were around the one you're looking for as a way to help pinpoint where yours might be so these kind of all of these things help you narrow down a date of death and burial, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a big one these days, of course, is ground penetrating radar, um, which I'm sure you've seen in the news a lot for the last few years um, because of the exploration of the residential school cemeteries. Um, that being said, um, for a project like ours, um, ground penetrating radar is a great tool, but um, it's not easy to do. It requires training costs money to get it done if, if you don't know how to do it yourself. And in addition to that, um, in our case, because Victoria Lawn is a currently operating cemetery with sometimes two or three funerals a day, it's not really looked kindly upon to sort of have devices out in the middle of the cemetery and that is operating. It doesn't really provide good optics for families and it sort of um, takes away from some of the, the sort of sacred aspect of the place for families. So all of these all of these things are important, as bullet point number two says, um, because you in the currently operating cemetery, especially you can't just sort of start probing or digging anywhere, or at least you shouldn't. Um, you should have some sense at least of where you're looking, and so that way you're not just making holes in the ground um, unnecessarily. <clears throat> so once you've actually sort of found a location, the next thing you do is is um, if you think the stone is underground, then you have to start probing. So in our case, um, we've we've used what's a, a fiberglass stake um, probe with a sharp end. And some people use metal, um, people use all kinds of different tools to probe. Um, the advantage to a fiberglass probe is that when you're probing, um, especially dealing with old stone, when you poke into the ground, fiberglass is is going to have a much better chance of not damaging the stone by accident if you go into the ground in the stone, whereas something that's uh, steel or metal of some kind can do damage to the stone. So once you start probing, you're you're, you're looking for a particular spot. You you there are lots of different ways you can try to sort of narrow it down based on 
you know, in this picture, you can see there's a stone beside it here. So you say, okay, well, um, it, it, chances are the next burial would be somewhat close by. So then you, you, you start probing sort of, you know, four to six feet, depending or, or less, depending on how the spaces were done in those rows. And then eventually um, you start hitting things. Now in a cemetery like Victoria Lawn, there are some rocky spots. So while you're probing, you tend to encounter things that will feel like you've hit a gravestone, but then when you just peel back the soil, you realize it's just a, a rock. So you sometimes get what I like to call are false hits, um, and then you have to keep going. So here's an example here. So this is Al, who is our, our restoration expert that we've hired to do a lot of the complex work. Al's been doing this for over 20 years um, and has contracts with the town of Oakville, he also has done some work and has a contract with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And he's also done interments for a long time as well um, for cemeteries where the space, old cemeteries where the space is, is um, too small for machinery to go in and do the digging. So he actually does the hand digging. So he has much a, a great deal of experience with all aspects of cemeteries. Um, and he's worked all over the Niagara Peninsula and, and um, into Haldeman County and into Kitchener, Waterloo, et cetera. So here is Al, as you can see, using the probe here. So this was actually for the Ballard spot, which as Rochelle mentioned, thanks to sort of um, local history history provided by Dennis and Bill and other people that have, have um, actually looked at this stone before, we had an approximate location already. Um, that being said, in this section of the cemetery, you can see little depressions here. So here's one, here's another, here's another. This section actually has stones laid, that were laid flat or fell and then were covered by grass all through it. So the, the difficulty was sort of finding which one of the fallen stones he was. So this was when Al had found the, the location. Um, I had gone out and done an initial look for it uh, last last uh, summer, I guess that would have been, or spring. And um, so we had a general location. I took photos to kind of figure it out uh, or to, to allow us to keep track and memory of what of where it was. So there's our probing. And then Rochelle showed you this picture already. Um, so it's surprising. And this I thought this was a good example of um, considering that the it was uh, Rochelle said approximately you know 15 years give or take since the stone was last seen that even in that amount of time the stone had already been covered by the sod again so it, even just in that amount of time it still had to be sort of um pulled the soil had to be the sod had to be pulled back and it had to be uncovered again after it was found um here's just a picture of Al doing a little bit of quick dry like a dry clean on it um and the idea here is to not use something that's a hard bristle brush that will potentially scratch the stone. So that he was just doing a quick brush off so we could get a look at it and kind of get pictures of it in, in its in situ before we decided to do the rest of it. So I don't have pictures of all of the um, process that went into it, but the final result, which um, we just recently unveiled was this. So now, as you can see, Henry Ballard is back up and, um, we had to choose a spot um, within that general area of where the stone was laid flat. And so we chose to put it at sort of the, the top of the stone, at the head of the stone. And he got a nice clean, as you can see, and also a spray with a, um, a spray called D2, which is which is an enzyme, an enzymatic spray, that, that a biocide that eats away at, at sort of um, some of the various organisms, biological organisms that will grow on gravestones and um, cause them both to be dirty and eat into the stone eventually. So he's he's a lot cleaner than he was, but uh, we'll be going back again in the spring and when the weather's better again to do more, another spray and probably even another hand clean. So it should look even better than that eventually. And um, in, in the hole, what was done was essentially a uh, hole was dug and then deep enough to fit this this stone didn't have a base originally it was just made long um, some of the 19th century stones were just made long at the tail so that they could just go straight far down into the ground so we just put it into the ground after digging a hole into limestone screenings and that that will help for both drainage and also for things for, such as ants and bug, various bugs which like to make like to make their nests in uh, their hives underneath gravestones and in even in the bases between the base and the stone and gravestones. So that's Henry Ballard. 
So Rochelle showed you this picture of uh, Amanda Stewart Gales Taylor. So this one was a, a little trickier um, just because when we uncovered the stone, it could, took us quite a while, even though we had figured out approximately where she where the stone was. Uh, it took us quite a while because the stone itself was so small to probe and find out exactly where it was. So we spent about 45 minutes on a very hot summer's day this summer. And I was probing and probing and probing and Rochelle and I were getting, trying to have optimism and hope, but getting a little more increasingly frustrated as time went on and it was starting to get quite hot. Um, and then finally, on the very last try, I hit something and I thought maybe this is it. And sure enough, there it was. So that was a moment of joy. Then we had the other moment of stress though, when I saw this tree root, um, it's, it's in front of a tree. So there was a root in front of it. And the danger with tree roots is that in some cases, they, they can be small and can be done away with without any significant damage to the tree or the stone. In other cases, um, tree roots love to hug gravestones in some cases. And sometimes the roots are so big that you, the only option would be to leave the stone or cut the tree down. And we weren't going to ask for permission to cut the tree down if that was the case. But we got very lucky and the root turned out to be small. So we were able to basically, Al very quickly um did a quick hack at it pulled it out uh we didn't have to disturb the stone at all while we were doing that we put it aside did some quick digging on it and um cleaning etc like we did with henry ballard's and then here we are so we we put it basically right around where it was just a little bit forward so it wasn't going to be close to some of the other little roots that we saw now th these were interesting stones because um we came across a few other ones that were the same style as this. And my initial thought when I saw this was that it might actually be a footstone um, that was, you know, at the end of, of a headstone to mark the burial place. Um, but it actually turned out that these were just a particular small style of stone, very simple. As you can see, there's no date, um, no birth or death date on it, even the name is short form. So it's a very modest stone. Um, but but still a beautiful little stone nonetheless, and it's nice that um, it's now above ground. Someone, when I shared this picture on social media, said, pointed out the irony that the fact that it was underground for quite a while may have helped preserve it from very the various aspects of of damage to gravestones that I pointed out at the beginning of this uh, part of the presentation. That being said. Gravestones were bought and made so they could be seen. Nobody in the family buys a gravestone for a family member so that it can stay underground so nobody can see it. So I still think that at the end of the day, it's nicer to have it above ground. Um, we might look into seeing if we can get permission to put a little bit of curbing around the stone, though, so that way um, when the caretakers are doing their work, there, there isn't as much of a chance of the stone accidentally being hit. Since it is such a small stone, it, it wouldn't take much to do some damage to it. So this is just a picture um, I just chose to, to take just to show you, give you some perspective. So there's the Gales Taylor stone there, Rochelle on the right, and there is Al, and there's his wife, Joanne, who also helps out with the rest and restoration work from time to time. Um, so just so you can get a sense of, of where it was and sort of why we were a little worried when we saw that there was a root there since it is very, very close to the tree. One of the other nice things about this, and we'll never know for sure, but um, given the position of the tree to the stone, there's actually a possibility that that tree was planted by one of the family members or friends, given the the, the position of it. It's, we can't say for certain, but it is sort of right in line with it. So there is a possibility and that's, I think that's quite a nice story. So that's the one I'm gonna go with. Um, so the, this next one, it was us looking for the Mary Hutchinson stone, which Rochelle talked about earlier. Um, so again, this one, we were fortunate that uh, the stone actually was right in front of, of where this base is, you can see in the background. So this is actually the base for the stone that itself has sunken underground over time. And there is actually the bottom piece of the stone. And so when we probed and found the stone, we actually are, are lucky in the sense that we have both, um, that we know we were able to match up. It's hard to tell from this picture, but we were able to match up the bottom, the way that this break in the stone looks with the break in the base here to, to show that these, these were two pieces of the same stone. So we know that this is where it, where it belongs or where it's from. Now, one of the nice things about um, 
Victoria Lawn Cemetery, and this is something I should have pointed out earlier, is that different cemeteries have had different policies and still do over what they do with some of these old stones when they fall. Uh, a lot of them, and I've been to many old cemeteries where you find old stones that once they fall down and break or something happens to them, they're taken away from the site of, of the burial of the original spot and then thrown into a corner, put against a wall, sometimes just carted away and then who knows what happens to them. So at Victoria Lawn, the nice thing is, is that there seems to have been even in the 19th century or, or early 20th century, whenever they broke a, a, a policy to leave the stones where they where they lied or laid. So the nice thing about that is that even though the grass eventually swallows them up, um, they're not they're still there, which is nice. And it gives you some indication. You won't always know for sure if you go to probe a spot and there is no stone, whether the person had a stone. Um, but it, it, having the stone there, obviously, it is much preferable to when somebody takes it away. And if you've ever been to um, some of the rural areas during the centennial in 67, just before that, there was a lot of funding that was given out for communities to commemorate their old cemeteries. And a lot of a lot of communities got the idea of doing various cairns and various little You've probably seen them where they, the stones are all put into a, a bunch together, you know, put into concrete or into a brick wall or things like that. Um, the problem with doing that is that once they're removed from the original spot, if there aren't cemetery records, then nobody will know where the people were ever actually buried. And even something like ground penetrating radar can't tell you because it will just tell you that there are people buried in that or things in that location. It won't tell you this was so and so. So. Again, Victoria and Mom were very fortunate that we that we are able to, in a lot of cases, find the stone near or in front of where it's supposed to be. This next one is just, I just took this just to show, um, this was while we were trying to uncover where we thought the Lindsay stone was or is. Um, and this was a tricky one because of the location. Again, we had an approximate location, but the 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 distance between where the Lindsay stone is and the stones around it is quite big. Um, and so you really have quite a wide area to look in order to try and find it. And this is another area where I encountered a lot of rocks as I was probing. So it took quite a while until we actually came across it. And just here, this was as I was starting to uncover it. And you can actually see here hands. It's very hard to tell, but this is the hands, the, the clasped hands that now show up in this picture. So here's this once it's uncovered, you can see those same hands here. Now this is going to be a tricky one and I honestly don't know yet what will be done with this um, simply because um, when we uncovered this, we didn't have the time nor had we done the fundraising yet to start the work on it. So the goal was to find it um, just to get a look and know that we knew where it was so that when we did hire somebody to do the work, we could show them where it was and they would know where to go. Um, as you can see, this one is in quite quite bad shape compared to some of the others. Um, it's quite a thick stone. You can't really tell from this photo, but it's a very tall stone. And it's I think if I remember correctly, it's three or four inches thick of marble. So it's quite big. Um, so chances are it when it fell, it fell hard. The, the old expression, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So this one will require some significant work. Um, possibly being laid flat and then some some mortar or, or other um, stone epoxy or something being used to piece it back together. We will know for sure more when the season starts next year and it's had some time to be brought up and dried. Um, and then we'll assess it from there. <clears throat> so Rochelle showed you this picture as well of, of triplet. Um, and, and this is just one of the I just wanted to talk very briefly about one of the very interesting aspects of a project like this is that in some cases, the records weren't always um, accurately kept or or a notation wasn't made of where somebody was buried. So in some cases, you're coming across people that you didn't even know were there, um, and hence what Rochelle was describing before. And so we're hoping with time, um, when we do actually go back and do more work next season, that as we probe further in these areas that we'll start to find more people that we didn't know were there and 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 from there be able to tell more history or to learn more history of people that um, maybe haven't been thought about in a very long time so that is one of the parts that's been the most rewarding so far is just that that aspect of mystery that allows you to 
feel like you're you're uncovering some history mysteries. So that's that's it for me. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I again want to thank the Historical Society for the invite and for all of you for for listening to us tonight. Um, please consider a donation. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. At, uh, here's my info here, and if you miss it, I can give it to you afterwards um, by email or, or the Historical Society can send it to you. Follow Rochelle on Facebook. She posts a lot of very interesting content. I've learned quite a bit from going on her Facebook and reading her, her daily posts about Black history and various other aspects of Canadian history. And here is the way you could make donations if you choose to. Um, these are various options, and then we're going to put the, the link in the in the chat box as well. So thank you very much, and thank you very much to the people who have donated thus far. Um, I, I know some of you are here tonight, and it's much appreciated. Um, I know my, several members of the Historical Society and then other people that I see in the, in the room tonight have made donations, so thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Okay, people can unmute themselves and also ask questions if they'd like. Okay, so I've seen the one in the chat. There's a couple of them there. But there was the one from Paul Hutchinson to everyone. Yes, Greg Miller did discover the Henry Ballard Stone and Dennis did bring that to my attention about, I'm going to say 15 years ago or longer. And then he also uh, put me in touch with Greg Miller. And I had an excellent conversation with him about um, the Henry Ballard Stone and others that are in that area. So I just wanted to address that one, but yes. Greg Miller did uncover that. There's two up there for you, Adam. Okay. Um, should we go? I guess it does it go start at the top by time, right? Um, so Joan Hutz, Joan Hudson, do you have a sense of the funeral rituals of the time? The funeral attendee. Um, rather than, uh, I don't know if she's referring to for the people were we're looking for or just in general well um just if you go with him anthony burns for example there's a wonderful obituary um about him and yes of course white people did attend and prominent white people as well but are there any known discriminatory funeral practices no is there a pauper section yes and it's mixed so again the, the main thing about showing the map is to show that black people are located throughout the cemetery it wasn't a segregated cemetery um, and I do have a relative who's buried in the pauper sec um, section as well, but on um, both sides, there's white people next to the individual who's buried there. The same with my uh, great, great grandmother, both sides of her white people are buried next to her. Same with Reverend Anthony Burns. So it wasn't a segregated cemetery and no discriminatory funeral practices to my knowledge. Hmm. Yeah, and funeral, if, if, if the question is about general funeral rituals of the time, um, there were there were many. A lot of it depended, to be honest, on on what people could afford. Um, there were elaborate rituals and elaborate things you could do. You know, the horse drawn hearse and and uh, the the weepers and all of the the mourners and all of the various mourning attire and all of the things, all the trappings that came with a sort of quote high Victorian funeral. Um, a lot of those can be read about in 19th century newspapers. They they really enjoyed describing some of these reporters, especially for prominent individuals, um, you know, like Anthony Burns or just anyone who was a well-known member of the community. They would often describe in great detail um, what what people wore, how many carriages there were, even things like what hymns were sung. So. Um, all all different kinds of things you can find from from the from the newspapers of the time. So would it be say, fair to say based on religion, like denomination, as well as fraternities? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So Victoria Lawn is an active cemetery from whom is run a So in our case, um, we we approached the city. So. Um, we, we basically talked to the mayor's office, explained the project, um, explained that the part the, that the purpose of the project was to be eventually provide a free um, walking tour for the public and um, basically the outlines of of the you know what the pro what we envisioned for the project as well as um, what both of our backgrounds were. So in Rochelle's case, you know being a, an encyclopedia of knowledge about the BME church and then in my case, 
um, having done a few years of restoration work and then been to having been to a lot of old cemeteries and being a historian myself, um, as well as having contacts like Al, um, who who are experts in it. So I, you know, I think we approach them with the idea that um, we're not just playing around in here. We we have a project that um, we're going to follow certain parameters, and we did come to an agreement with them on certain things like um, uncovering the stones, but then covering them back up until the work started so that the stones weren't just being laid out there. Um, Greg Miller discovered the Henry Ballard stone. Uh, okay, we saw that one. Another one from Betsy from Barry Cemetery. Two major problems are acid rain and maintenance equipment. Yes, yeah. So acid rain certainly is a problem in the modern modern era um, because it does eat into stone like marble and limestone. Um, so it definitely is a problem. Um, unfortunately, not one we seem to be able to do much about given the um, humanity's uh, unfortunate love of polluting. Um, maintenance equipment. Um, this one, maintenance equipment really does depend on the place. Uh, I've seen cemeteries where the grounds crew really don't seem to care too, too much. And I've seen stones get knocked over and things like that. Um, but in the case of Victoria Lawn, I've never seen anything like that. The groundskeepers there seem to take quite a good care, and, um, at least from my experience of paying attention where they're mowing and things like that. But certainly um, when you when you come across old stones, you can see if they've been hit by a mower, um, they get what's called mower scars, um, all, all sort of along the bottom of the stone, right along the ground. And you'll actually see what look like scratch marks or like almost like a knife has been taken across it. Um, so you can tell in certain aspects. And I was at a cemetery recently in Mississauga, where you could actually see the tire track of a of a riding mower that it was right over top. The dirt track had actually gone right over top of the flat gravestones. Certainly, it does happen, um, but it, it I, I think for the most part, groundskeepers try to try their best. And certainly in Victoria Lawn's case, they they seem to care quite a bit about them, and I've never seen any instances of it there. Any more questions? Are there any more in the chat? I'm not sure. See any right now. I'd like to ask a question if I could. Dennis, sure. go. Um, yes, Adam. Um, I just wanted to get a feeling for the statistics on this. How many? How many uh, of the buried uh, gravestones have you discovered by now? Um, how many have you uncovered? How many more are there, are there to be uncovered? Pardon me if I if if you mentioned that, that earlier and I missed it. Sorry. Um, How many uh, gravestones, uh, buried gravestones, have you discovered by now? How many of them have have uh, been uncovered? How many are still awaiting to be uncovered? Uh, I'm curious. Um, I don't actually have the list with me, Rochelle. Do you have the list with you handy? Okay, so. Right now we're up to 21, but we can make it up to 30. So these are people that we know definitely have stones. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's as that's as far as I'm gonna say now, Dennis. <laughs> that's <Okay>. it. <laughs> all right. Yeah. And and I yeah, so some of them all I'll just like Tommy Douglas, for example, Thomas Douglas, greatest horseman in Niagara, and he escaped with Burr Plato. We know he's in section J, he's gonna be difficult. We know he has a stone. But is the road, is his stone, did the road pave over his stone? That's the thing. So he's going to be one of the difficult ones to look for. So he's just one. And then, of course, there's Aaron Young, another difficult one. Three wives, but is he buried with them? So we have to, we know where the sections are. And it's just wrong nurse. to find them. So those are just nurse. a few. So prominent names that you're all familiar with. Catherine? Yeah, and in the case of, um, in the case of, like, Lindsay, for example, um, after we uncovered his stone, um, I felt what I thought potentially could be two, possibly three other stones in that same plot. Um, but again, part of it um, has been a time thing because uh, up until basically until we, we went in to do the initial round of work several weeks ago, um, we've been sort of doing it on weekends and just sort of here and there when we have the time. So oftentimes we would go, we'd find one, and then we would have to come back later and do it. It's 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 a very, uh, it can be a very time consuming thing. And especially 
when you're dealing with weather, like in the summer, you can't really, you know, you can't be out there too long before you start to get quite hot. So, but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're hoping in, in some cases, like with Lindsay to at least find another two or three. And then a lot of it, I think will just be once we get Al into the cemetery for a full day's work next season, um, then it'll be, you know, he, he, he's has enough experience to be able to, um, do find a whole section of worth of stones if they're there. So then it'll be shovels in the ground and uh more probing and then hopefully we we uncover ones as we go that we didn't know were there but so i, I guess the, the basic answer is we started with a number and then the number has grown and keeps growing and we don't we don't know where the number will end but but uh <laughs> i would like it to end at 30 because it's a lot um yeah. maybe even 25 but again dennis with the case of alfred uh triplet looking for one individual but you go there and then you find eight and then you figure out, you find, you discover that those people are prominent as well, like Charles Bell that I mentioned. And then, of course, Charles Bell's wife, Susan Taylor. These are people that are listed in um, the Rick Bell collection that's at Brock University. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hmm. And they're freedom seekers. It's not like they're um, descendants of the freedom seekers. They were actual freedom seekers. Could I ask a question? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, could you put up, uh, for, for those that don't know, both Adam, your your you know Canadian cemeteries uh, site because it's fascinating it's a brilliant site and I think that people would be interested in it. and also the project site for the the one that you're raising money for for oh, yes. doing more if you could yes. put both of those up on for everybody to see that would be really helpful I think yes should have remembered thanks Gail that's okay should have remembered to do that you want to share your screen again Adam um, well, I'm going to just put the GoFundMe in there. Okay. <clears throat> and I, yeah. I did put the website. Um, Diana oh. asked. Diana asked. I put uh, and I put it above there. Uh, you scroll up a bit there. Okay, so it's all in the chat. It's ca yeah. Canadian Cemeteries History .ca, right? Uh, can he, yeah, just Canadian Cemetery History .ca. Yeah, all yeah. all lowercase. Yes. Yes. It's in the chat now. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, and Joan Joan has a question about. Oh, sorry, Gail, you had a question. No, well, I just wanted the the GoFundMe. Uh... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Joan, do you know where the stone was quarried and who the carvers were? Um, so, depends on the stone. So so far, I haven't come across any makers marks on the stones that we've uncovered to know who. I I was looking for Ballard when we saw his. Um, just out of curiosity, that that is something I'm always curious about. Um, so I haven't seen any maker's marks yet, but I'm hoping with time we'll come across them. Um, and in terms of where the stone was quarried, it really depends. Um, the stone was quarried, like depending on the time period, was quarried from all over. Um, a lot of the limestone came from the Queenston limestone quarry in Queenston. Um, so certainly some of, a lot of it came from there if it was that. Marble came from places as far away of it as Italy, if it was if it was the really expensive marble. Um, and then there's a blue Vermont marble that you'll see. The the Gail Taylor's Gail's Taylor stone was a, a type of Vermont marble. And um that's got that kind of bluish gray look. Um, so that as the name suggests, Vermont. So it, it really just depends. And then the granite was sometimes depending on um the company was sometimes brought like from Scotland. So um, again, just depended on the place. If you're interested, there's, um, <clears throat> I have it. Uh, there's an old document that was done called Landscapes of Memories that was in the early 2000s. That was a guide that was done about conserving historic cemeteries. Um, it was on the it was on the Ontario Heritage Trust website and then it got it's not there anymore for some reason um, a friend mentioned that a few weeks ago I don't know why it's not there anymore um, but that talks quite a bit about um, about where the granite and where the marble and limestone where the various stones were quarried at different times so if you want to if you're a nerd like me and you want to read about it here I can put the I'll put the in the chat box there so you can google it Several websites have it as a 
um, in a PDF to download. So if you can't find it, um, let me know and I can email it to you. I think there was, is there one more question in the chat box, I think? Maybe that'll be the last. <laughs> when are walking tours offered? Hmm. Is that Rochelle again? Or do? Well, I guess the short answer is we don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> Rochelle, do you? Uh... I, I think it'll, I think it'll it'll really just depend on how long the work takes and and um, you know really from there what uh, we'll have to put it together. So it's really hard to say at this point, but we're hoping the work won't take too long once the season starts next year in the late spring, early summer. So um, if the work's all done by then, then um, potentially by the end of next year. Okay, it looks like are there still two more questions, Dave? Dave Allett, if you got your hand up there. If you do, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> I think Dennis um, had his hand up too. Dennis's hand. Dennis, you might. Yeah, okay. If, uh, about, uh, about tours of the cemetery, if the question was more in the, in the nature of when are there ge ever general tours of the cemetery, uh, they tend to be in the fall. And in fact, uh, they're sponsored, I guess, by the museum and by the cemetery and they tend to be in the fall and they also tend to be uh, dramatized walking tours of the cemetery and uh, I understand that they're, they're quite interesting so you might keep your eyes open for that let's say in September of, of every year I think they'll, they'll turn up. I also oh, yeah. I had I also had another uh, another bit of a question Adam uh, and, and Rochelle um, when I visited the um, Ballard grave site uh, a long time ago, his grave site or his buried stone was um, amongst a group of maybe as many as 15 such stones in an area which for for all uh, intents and purposes looked very much like just an, an open space where nothing was going on. Uh, um, and there was some speculation about how that particular group of buried stones came about as if they were somehow connected with one another as if as if they might even uh, be reburials from uh, a, a, another cemetery i mean in the case of ballard ballard died in 1854 that's two years before victoria lawn any mm -hmm. any speculations on your part about uh, about that little plot with so many buried stones yeah no that's something i've puzzled about especially when in looking, we when we uncovered there was one right in front of Ballard, and I can't remember the name. They were they said they were from Scotland originally, if I recall correctly. But um, that was my my um, my thought as well, and I puzzled over it. I don't know um, where my my speculation would be. You know, when the when the new cemeteries, municipal cemeteries like Victoria Lawn were made. Um, in a lot of instances across North America, a lot of the stones were brought from family farm cemeteries or from the churchyards that were scattered throughout cities. So it's possible that they came from one of the churchyards or from a family cemetery. But in Ballard's case, that, I don't think that would be the case. So it's really hard to say. I mean, you know, I think of, um, is it Sarah? In yeah, Sarah Ingersoll, who's on the, the far east side of the cemetery there who's an old she has an old limestone one of Laura Secord's sisters that has the limestone there and hers is like dated 1827 right so clearly moved at some point right um so I I can't say specifically where um that's something I'd like to look into at some point once uh things sort of quiet down in the fall and winter when we're indoors a lot more I'm, I'm hoping to maybe look into I, I would hope that maybe the paper might have a mention somewhere about it but the problem with so many of those things is that with the reburials they didn't often really talk about it um like it didn't really seem to gather much notice from newspapers even though you would think it would like one prominent one that comes to mind is joseph brant when brant was when he was when his remains were moved there are all kinds of newspaper articles on it um in the states as well as canada so i think obviously because of his his historical prominence but for the most part, you're you're left speculating, which is, which is, uh, yeah, you know, but 
if you come across anything, please let me know. <laughs> so. Well, nothing, nothing to offer on that other than to just note that there were, if, I think, four cemeteries in downtown St. Catharines that, that did have to be moved. There was mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the one be behind uh, St. Paul Street United Church. Uh, uh, there, there was one for, I think, First Presbyterian Church. Uh, mm -hmm. there, in recent years, we've heard a bit about the burials behind the, the Catholic the Catholics, uh, uh, um, cathedral and of course the ones also at st george's uh, uh, and, but yeah a lot of candidates uh, go, go ahead start. Uh, well i was just going to say maybe one day depending if there if there ever was permission to uncover those ones um you know using taking those names and then and then uh, sort of plugging them in to various you know your usual research avenues city directories newspapers etc that there might be some indication of more info about those people and then from there, maybe um, a look into potentially where they might have been buried originally. And then that might be a clue that could lead you. Uh, unfortunately, you know, unless you have that smoking gun evidence that says they, you know, they were interred here, it would be hard to tell, um, I think, in most cases where the original site was, but at least it would give you a clue anyway, right? Just to pursue this just a tiny bit further with with Rochelle, is, is there is there any hint in the uh, in the church records that the 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 BME church ever had a burial site of its own? Um, there's no church records, Dennis. But my guess is going to be that yes, it would have had a burial site of its own because chances are very slim that they would have been buried with white people. Mm -hmm. So why uh, the only one that I would think would maybe be the old St. Paul Street Methodist Church, but highly unlikely as well, because we had um, our own plots of land in that area. So where would the Zion Baptist Church folk be buried? Um, but going back to that plot of land that you're talking about in old section B, um, I would love to see them uncovered because there's a possibility that they could be people of African descent. They could be members of the BME Church or perhaps the Zion Baptist Church. So I would like to see that happen. Okay, thank you. Looks like Bob Halfyard has his hand up. Bob, question or comment? Yeah. Well, just a comment. I just want to comment that way back, um, good 30 years ago, you mentioned Greg Miller. Greg Miller did a lot of work on that and he found the two plots where the Methodist and the Presbyterians were buried when they were moved from the church yards. So somebody should, maybe should get in touch with Greg and see what he remembers about it. Mm. Yes, uh, well, I've done that, Bob, thank you. Um, and I've done that recently within the past year and a half. And uh, he does not recall if they were members of the BME church. Okay, I think there might be just one more, or is there not? Dave Allett, have you got your hand up? No? Well, maybe we should end this here. I, I have a feeling we could sit here all night and there's so much interest in this topic. It's, it's fantastic. And thank you so much, Rochelle and Adam, for all your work. Well, thank uh, you, thank you for the invite. Such a worthwhile initiative. And to everyone, please consider donating and you have seen the websites they have been put up. Um, and further, I would just like to give one announcement. Um, our next meeting will be November 24th and uh, they're always the third, the fourth Thursday of the month. And our speaker then will be Adam Schultz who is, uh, lives locally but explores all around the world. Uh, he's a writer. He will be talking about his most recent book, which is called Whisper on the Night Wind. Uh, please watch for our posters, promos, etc. That will also be a one well worth watching and joining. And that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Before I was going to add that I actually listened to Adam give his talk about that book. Um, I want to say when was that that would have been sometime in the spring or summer but very very fascinating well worth well worth listening to all right he, another adam <laughs> yeah he's a he's a fantastic speaker and um the mm -hmm. whole story about that book is, is really fascinating not just 
his how how he came to write it but just the whole yeah the whole thing is so anyway that's just a little plug for adam schultz well all right <laughs> terrific <laughs> we need it <laughs> great thank you so much everyone i guess okay. that's it then thank you good night, good night. Thank, you. Good night. thank you everybody bye